G'day, welcome to the second lesson into our chemical energetics unit. Continuing on with what we were looking at in lesson one, we are now looking at calculating enthalpy changes and the concept of calorimetry. Well, the lesson objective is to understand how to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction from experimental data obtained via calorimetry. Just the one learning outcome for the lesson in this video. Excellent, so what have we looked at? We've looked at what enthalpy is and what enthalpy changes in chemical reactions mean. Exothermic, we're letting off heat, endothermic, we're taking in heat. We're gonna look at how we can get these enthalpy values from experimental techniques, specifically from something called calorimetry. But just to recap, delta H is the energy that is transferred in a chemical reaction. We can determine experimentally in the lab using laboratory techniques and calculations from experimental results. So we have this technique called calorimetry which uses a calorimeter, fancy that. It's a technique to measure the amount of heat released or absorbed by a chemical reaction. And what it does is it measures the uh, temperature change of a reaction and then we can use the relationships between energy and temperature and the calculations or a few calculations to determine the enthalpy change for that reaction, whether it's a combustion reaction or a neutralization or whatever it is. So it uses this thing here, which is a calorimeter. Essentially, all a calorimeter is, is just an insulated container. You can do this very simply in a lab just using a styrofoam cup for certain reactions. The styrofoam works as a good insulator. The insulator just allows the heat to remain, or as best as it can remain, all the heat remains in the reaction vessel, so we don't lose any to the surroundings. But we'll talk about the limitations at the end of the lesson. So we have some sort of insulated container with a lid. The lid for the same reason, we don't want that heat dissipating out into the um, atmosphere. Otherwise, the temperature changes we record will be less than what they actually are. So we're trying to keep as much heat in this system as we can so that we can get the temperature change to be as accurate as it is without losing too many things to the surroundings. Then we have some sort of thermometer there and a reaction mixture there. So what we do is we measure the temperature and then we can use this equation to convert between energy and temperature. This equation has delta H. We're very familiar with delta H now. That's the change, delta for change in enthalpy is equal to negative M, M for mass. C is this uh, constant called specific heat capacity. We're gonna talk about that in a second as well. And then delta T, delta the same over here means change T for temperature. So in this uh, specific equation, we have our enthalpy change in the units of joules. We have mass in the unit of grams. Delta T, the change in temperature in degrees Celsius. And this specific heat capacity there, this is in the units of joules per gram Per degree Celsius like so so this is the value that is really helping us convert from the temperatures that we measure to the enthalpy of the reaction so over here Delta H enthalpy change M is the mass of water C is specific heat capacity Delta T the temperature change right so let's explore this idea of a specific heat capacity with the symbol C what it is, it's a value that links energy to temperature. It is the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of a substance per unit mass. So let's consider these units if we write them out like this. We got joules per gram per degree Celsius. So it's saying how much energy is needed to raise a gram of a substance by a degree Celsius. How much energy to require is required to raise that much Matter by how much temperature. It is specific to a certain substance. It's called the specific heat capacity. It's specific. So the specific heat capacity of water is going to be different to the specific heat capacity of ethanol. It's specific to a certain substance. And that just all comes down to the chemical properties of the certain substance making it specific and unique. Let's consider how the units cancel out in delta H equals minus MC delta T. So if I rewrite this equation, putting my units there instead of the symbols. So the 
enthalpy change, we want to find out is the joules, how much energy. So this is equal to the negative grams times by the temperature, which is degrees Celsius, times by the joules per grams degrees Celsius. So we can measure the temperature and we can measure the mass very easily in the laboratory, thermometer and a scale, or we use the idea that a centimeter cubed of water is equal to a gram. Um, and then this allows us to get the joules because if we cancel out all these units, the grams will cancel out, the degrees Celsius will cancel out, and it will just be left with the energy there. So the specific heat capacity of water is that value, 4.18. What this means is that we need this much energy, 4.1 joules of energy, to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degrees Celsius. So there are a few assumptions that we're making here. Number one is that one centimeter cubed of the solution does have a weight of one gram. So our reaction's been taking place in water, we're just assuming that one centimeter cubed of our solution will be the same weight as one centimeter cubed of water, which is one gram. And then we're also assuming that 4.18 grams will be the specific heat capacity, will be the same specific heat capacity as our solution, even though if we have a substance dissolved in water, it could potentially change that value a little bit. We're just using that value as the closest possible value that we have. Okay, before we go into some examples, let's just note this negative sign present in our equation. We said that if we have an exothermic reaction, we are letting off heat energy. If we're measuring the heat energy of an exothermic reaction, we will see an increase in the temperature. If we didn't have the minus sign there, and we got a positive value for mass, because you can't have a negative mass, C, we have a positive value for C, 4.18. And then if our delta T is positive, all of this would be positive, but when we looked in our previous lesson, we said that the delta H for an exothermic reaction has to be minus. So there's a negative sign there to make sure that when we have a positive temperature increase, we will end up with a negative delta H value. Similarly, if we have a negative temperature, so we record the temperature going down, that would imply it's an endothermic reaction. We know that endothermic reactions have a positive sign. So if we have a negative value for delta T, a negative times a negative will give us a positive value for delta H. Right, let's look at some examples and how we do these calculations. I'm in the lab, I'm doing an acid-base reaction, and I want to know the entropy change of neutralization. I have 50 centimeters cubed, 1.0 mole decimeter cubed sodium hydroxide, I react that with 50 centimeters cubed of one mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid. The initial temperature was recorded at 19 degrees Celsius, and the final temperature was 25 degrees Celsius. Determine the enthalpy change of neutralization for this reaction with our specific heat capacity having a value of 4.18. Let's pump in some numbers to some equations. All right, write out my equation. Delta H is equal to minus MC delta T. I'm given a mass of, I've got 50 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide solution, 50 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid solution. That means I have, I mix them together, I got 100 centimeters cubed of my reaction mixture. We're assuming that one centimeter cubed is equal to one gram, so our mass is equal to 100 grams. My value for C is 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius, like so. Um, and then my temperature, I'm given an initial temperature of 19 degrees Celsius. I'm given a final temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So my initial temperature, 19 degrees Celsius. Final temperature was 25 degrees Celsius. So my delta T is going to be equal to six degrees Celsius. Excellent, we're all in our units that we need to be in. Let's pump all this into the equation. Minus M minus 100 times 4.18 times by six. Calculator, I plug all that in. Minus 100 times 4.18 times six. I get a value of minus 2508 joules. Let's look at some significant figures in my measurements. Three significant figures, three, two, and two. Let's say I've got minus 2.5 kilojoules 
N2 significant figures. Beaut. All right, let's have a look what we got here. Cool. But problem, enthalpy changes are given in kilojoules per mole. At the moment, I've just got the heat that's left off, that heat that's given off from the reaction. I've got to work out how much heat is given off per mole. So if I've got the amount of kilojoules and I want to get to kilojoules per mole, I've got to divide this by the number of moles. So that's all you're gonna do. Simply divide by the number of moles of the substance. So let's have a look up here, my substances. Both cases, I've got 50 centimeters cubed of a 1.0 mole per decimeter cubed solution. So I can get the number of moles from that. If we think back to our number of moles equation, we have N equals M over M, but we also have C is equal to N over V. So N is equal to CV. My concentration was 0. Point, no, my concentration was 1.0. My volume, I got to multiply that by, I've got to convert from centimeters cubed into decimeters cubed. So I'm going to divide by a thousand. So I'm going to multiply that by 0. 0.05 and that's going to give me 0. 0.05. So then to get the number of moles, a number of kilojoules per mole, and I've got the moles over here, I've got the kilojoules over there, I just go the that divided by that, which if I punch that into my calculator, we should get an answer of 50 kilojoules per mole to two significant figures. Let's check out a, another question. 1.50 grams of sodium hydroxide dissolved in 100.5, 100.45 centimeters cubed of water and produced a temperature change of 3.6 degrees Celsius. What is the delta H plimsoll? So we've done this at standard conditions. Last lesson, we discussed the symbol plimsoll and we said that that means it's at standard conditions. So let's do the same thing. Back to my whiteboard. I've got my equation, delta H is equal to minus MC delta T. <coughs> As always, if you wanna have a go and then check it, now would be the time to do that. We've got a mass of not 1.50 grams. Remember, it's the mass of our water. So we got a mass of 100.45 grams. Mass is equal to 100.45 grams. Our C is 4.18. That's always for the specific heat capacity of water. My delta T is equal to 3.6 degrees Celsius. We're given that in the question. Plug all of these in, minus 100.45 times 4.18 times 3.6 we get a delta H of 100.45 times 4.18 times 3.6, 1511.57, 1, 1, but that's joules, we want joules per mole. So, or I'll convert this to kilojoules, we'll say 1.5 kilojoules, we want the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. That's equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. Now we've got the mass of sodium hydroxide here, 1.50 grams. 1.50 grams, divide that by the molar mass of sodium hydroxide, 39.997. We can get that from the periodic table, molar mass of sodium plus oxygen plus hydrogen. Put all of that on my calculator together and we get 39.997, 0.038 moles. Then if I get 1.5 and divide that by my answer, I should get an answer of minus 40 kilojoules per mole, which is indeed what I have on my calculator. Excellent. Let's finish off today with one last look at another type of reaction we can measure using calorimetry, which is a combustion reaction. Combustion reaction is the reaction with oxygen and we can measure the heat given off from a certain fuel by placing the fuel source with the sort of ignition, the burning there underneath the calorimetry and we have some sort of metal container, metal calorimeter this time that can take in the heat from the uh, flame from the combustion reaction that occurs 
And then we have a known mass of water in the same way we can measure the increase in the temperature there based on the energy given off down here. Let's do an example of that. We have 2.9 grams of methanol burnt. So we have our methanol down here. Increasing the temperature of 250 centimeters cubed of water from 20 to 43 degrees Celsius. What was the enthalpy change of combustion for this reaction? Now, as we've been doing, I'm going to write the equation that we're using. Delta H is equal to minus MC delta T. As we always do, I'm going to collate my information over here. The mass we are given is the mass of the water, 250 centimeters cubed, assuming one centimeter cubed is equal to one gram, our mass is equal to 250 grams. C is 4.18, our delta T, we are going from 20 degrees Celsius to 43.0 degrees Celsius, so we have an increase of 23.0 degrees Celsius. Beaut, let's punch all that in over here, minus. 250 times 4.18 times 23.0. That gives me an answer of minus 250 times 4.18 times 23 minus 24035 joules. Let's say minus 24.0 kilojoules. Three significant figures, three significant figures, three significant figures, three significant over there. But we're not done, we've got to work out how many moles of the substance we burnt. We have 2.9 grams of methanol. So we've got to work out the number of moles of the methanol that we have burnt. It's equal to mass divided by molar mass. The mass was 2.9 grams. The molar mass, get these values off the periodic table, carbon is 12 plus four, uh, four hydrogens, three plus one, four times one plus 16 for the oxygen. Punch all that on my calculator, 2.9 divided by 12 plus 4 plus 16. Oh no, we get 0 0.09 moles. So to get kilojoules per mole, I'm just gonna divide that by the number of moles. And I'm going to end up with minus 24 divided by 0 0.09. Minus 266.57 kilojoules per mole. Significant figures. I've got three, I've got three. I'm gonna give this in three. Let's say that's going to be minus 26. That's gonna round up to 267 kilojoules per mole. Three significant figures. Let's check that over here. Indeed. All right, let's finish up today by discussing some limitations to calorimetry. Firstly, heat can be lost to the surroundings. We can have heat lost to the calorimeter itself. We can have heat that is lost as we are mixing, as we're putting the reactants together. We've got to quickly put the lid on, but we could have some heat that is lost before we even manage to do that. We can have assumptions that were made in the calculations. We're assuming that one centimeter cubed of solution weighs one gram. We're assuming the specific heat capacity of water. If we have an uneven heating, if we don't have the reactants mixing well, we can have an uneven heating, which will give us uh, not the most valid results. And then heat can be lost before the reaction has even gone to completion. So whilst the reaction has started, the heat can be lost whilst the reaction is still undergoing, which means that we don't reach that maximum temperature that we theoretically should. And I mean, especially in this kind of combustion reaction calorimetry, I mean, we're gonna lose lots of heat to the surroundings uh, whilst we're burning the fuel over here. But it's a good experiment that can be used to get the, uh, to get the delta H's of reactions Excellent, and that concludes the lesson. What have we done? We've calculated enthalpy changes from appropriate experimental results, including the use of the relationship delta H equals minus MC delta T. As always, tasks to consolidate. You could pause the video if you want to do them and go one column at a time, starting from the bottom, working your way up. Thanks for your time. I look forward to seeing you next time as we continue our look into this unit on chemical energetics.